Hey, it's great to be here, and I do uh, want to thank all the volunteers. You're doing a great job. This is a great building, and I uh, really want to commend. I love every opportunity I have to get together with pastors. I really have a deep love and respect for pastors, but especially all of you serving Jesus here in the Northeast, because I know it's not easy. And so thank you for what you do, and thank you for your ministry. Well, LCN is all about making disciples. And I want to encourage you that it's not as hard as you may think. Every pastor, disciple making needs to be what his ministry is all about. And every church member has been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to make disciples. So we all have the same job. Nathan gave us the big picture. How do you do it? You do whatever Jesus said. Well, I'm going to share with you how I became a disciple maker. I was 19 years old. I was a sophomore at a Christian, university, a Christian college, extremely strict. Went home for Christmas break, read a little booklet called Born to Reproduce. And it was about the need to make disciples. So I began to pray. I said, God, if you will give me somebody to invest in, I will disciple them. Prayed every night for two weeks. God, give me somebody to invest in and I will disciple them. And a guy came up to me from across the hall. His name is Daryl. And he said, hey, I hear that you know how to spend time with God every day. He said, I, I've only been saved a little while. I had only been saved a little while. He said, I've only been saved a little while. I don't know how to spend time with God. Would you show me how to spend time with God every day? And I said, sure. And we decided uh, we were going to get together every night for a, a few weeks anyway. But the problem was our schedules were crazy. I was, I was involved in my church big time. I was taking a lot of classes. He was taking a lot of classes. He had a job. My college was extremely strict. The only place you were allowed to talk in the dormitory was after 11 p.m. was the only time Daryl and I could get together. And the only place you were allowed to talk in the dorm after 11 p.m. was the men's restroom, the bathroom. <laughs> it is big. There were 80 men, but it was a big place. And uh, the only place you could have a light on was in the bathroom. So Daryl and I met the next night at 11 o'clock. We prayed together. We read uh, and memorized the scripture together. We studied the Bible together. We prayed again. And it was awesome. We decided we we're going to keep doing this. I laid in bed that night and I said, God, this is so awesome. Would you give me another disciple? Well, Daryl and I kept meeting. Uh, in fact, the next night we decided to call ourselves the Bathroom Baptist Temple. And so the Bathroom <laughs> Baptist Temple was born. I had prayed every night for two weeks. Two weeks later, uh, we go into the bathroom. The only place we could really get together was at the sinks. There were two sets of sinks, the sinks down at this end. We sat down, we opened our Bible, and this, this big blonde kid came running in, and he said, hey, I, I want to join. And I said, join what? And he said, the Bathroom Baptist Temple. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you even know about the Bathroom Baptist Temple? He said, every night for the last two weeks, I've been brushing my teeth at this other set of sinks, and God has told me, I need what you got. Now, you've got to understand something. I was 19 years old. I'd only been a Christian a short time. I didn't know a lot, but I knew more than Daryl, and this guy's name was Tim. All I did was invest, be committed to invest in them, to pray for them, pray with them, and open the word with them. That's all I did. Turn to the person next to you, pretend you're a little bit mobbed up, and say, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> well, I got in bed that night, and I'm laying there, and I go, God, this is awesome. This is so much fun. Uh, I said, if you will give me another person to invest in, I'll disciple them. This is the truth. Exactly two weeks later, me and Daryl and Tim are there under the sinks. 
and this redheaded kid comes running in and he goes, am I too late? I want to join. I said, join what? He said, the bathroom Baptist temple. I said, you got to be kidding. How have you even heard of the Bathroom Baptist Temple? He said, I am Tim's roommate. <laughs> and he has changed so much in the last two weeks. And all he talks about is the Bathroom Baptist Temple. So at that time, we were the fastest growing church in Virginia. <laughs> All I did was make a commitment of time to invest in them. I prayed for them uh, every night when I was with them. I prayed for them when I was not with them. We opened the Bible. I, whatever I learned that day, they got that night. I wasn't a great theologian or anything else. I was just one step ahead of them. You can do that. Everyone in this room can do that. And that's how you make disciples. Well, I kept praying. And soon the bathroom Baptist temple had outgrown the bathroom. And the, uh, the, the, the resident assistants over our dorm gave us our own room, which we filled up. And out of that bathroom Baptist temple that year, uh, a whole bunch of pastors, missionaries, two guys that led major missions organization. Uh, the next year, this is the exciting thing. Daryl started his own discipling group. Tim started his own discipling group. Jim, Tim's roommate, started his own discipling group. I started another one, a guy named Rod Dempsey, who you're going to hear, you ought to go here in a breakout, uh, was one of my disciples. I only did three things. Invest, pray, and the Word. Now, my story is, went through Liberty, campus pastor at Liberty, started church in Ohio, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but um, when I went, after 20 years at that church, I went to teach back at Liberty University. My second year there, I was teaching in a graduate school. They said, you're going to be teaching undergrads pastoral duties. I said, okay. Um, I got the old syllabus, and I didn't like what it was about. It was only about being a chaplain, which is a good thing, but it was only about being a pastor chaplain. Counseling, running meetings, doing visitation, weddings, and funerals. And I said, what's the Bible say about pastoring, disciple making, shepherding? So I went back to the Old Testament. The first place it was really described, and in Exodus 18, we get the story of Moses and his father-in-law Jethro. And I, I saw something that really jumped out at me. So I, the first thing I want to talk about is Moses and the three things every pastor, every disciple maker must do. In Exodus 18, it says, So then Moses' father-in-law saw that all that Moses did for the people. He said, what, what is this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? See, he was a solo pastor. He was doing all of it himself. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another. And I, I made known the statutes of God and his law. He kind of liked being the, the main guy. Everybody had to come to him. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, the main thing that, the thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you. You're not able to perform it yourself. In essence, he's saying, this isn't God's plan, and it's not even good leadership. He had 600,000 men. All day, all night, every, every day, every night, Moses was on duty, everybody came to him. You know, if you're the pastor of a smaller church, I think that really you can get trapped into that so easily, where just everybody comes to you. It's all all being directed to you, and that will burn you out. That's what he says. Well, then he gives Moses some powerful advice, three things every pastor and disciple maker must do. First thing he says is pray, verse 19. Stand before God for the people so that, th that you may bring their difficulties to God. Take time and pray. 
Stand before God, intercede for your people, spend time praying. Then he says, verse 20, teach. You shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way that they must walk and the work they must do. Teach them the word and how to live it out. Pray, word, invest in leaders. Verse 18 to 22. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, ha- men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such of them over to be rulers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and rulers of tens. Let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. Invest in people, invest in potential leaders, pray and give them the word. Now, let me ask you a question. Wasn't that what I was doing in the bathroom, Baptist temple? Third person next to you go, you can do it. <laughs> you can do this. And notice what he says in verse 22. So it will be easier for you. Hey, you're not going to burn out. For they will bear the burdens with you. Let other people uh, help bear the burdens. If you do this and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all the people will also go to their place in peace. Invest in people, pray for people, pray with people, and give them the word. That, that is how you make disciples. That is how you lead churches. You say, Dave, that's really nice, but you know. Well, I, I've still got to, I've got to teach this class in a few weeks. I want to give them what the Bible says. I said, if this is a true principle, it will be elsewhere in Scripture. Well, I had been personally in my devotions doing a deep dive on the life of Jesus. I was reading it every day, reading a couple chapters every day in different translations for several years, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I noticed Jesus spent all his time doing three things. What did Jesus do? Number one, he prayed. Fifteen times in the gospel we read about Jesus praying. Luke, the, the one that presents the humanity of Christ, mentions Jesus praying 11 times. Got a question for you. If Jesus needed to pray, how much more do you and I? If Jesus didn't do ministry without prayer, why are we trying to do ministry without prayer? You know, this is an oversimplified comment, but I want you to think about this. The average pastor in China, where the church has grown from 3 million to uh, anywhere from 50, 70 to 120 million, depending on who's doing the counting, the average pastor is bivocational and he spends two hours a day in prayer. In North America, the average pastor spends, depending on what survey you read, as much as 15 minutes and as little as seven minutes a day in real prayer. In China, church is exploding. In North America, not exactly. How's your prayer life? Well, let me give you another one. I'm, I'm saying if this is a true principle, it's going to be elsewhere. Moses, Jesus, you go to the apostles. What were the three things they did? What are the three things every disciple maker must do? We find out in Acts 16 where they get busy. The, the church is growing. They've got growing pains. It's a great thing. Acts chapter 6 and verse 2, then the 12 summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, look, it's not right for us to give up preaching about God to wait on tables. The widows, the, the, the Jewish ones and the Greek ones were arguing about who was getting the lunch. He uh, said, it's not right for us to give up preaching the word to wait on tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation full of the spirit and wisdom who we can appoint to this duty and we will devote ourselves to prayer or if you you, technically you can uh, grammatically you can say the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. That's what we're going to prioritize in our lives. 
Now, you got to understand, in the first century, the ministry of prayer in Jerusalem was this. You went to the temple area, and if you couldn't, you stopped where you were, and for 20 minutes, you met with God. They went to the temple because they would sacrifice three times a day, morning, uh, noon, and late afternoon. They would sacrifice three times a day, and after the sacrifice, they felt that the heavens were open and they could pray. So the disciples, if you read the Bible carefully, you'll find the day of Pentecost started at 9 a.m. in the temple where they had gone right after the sacrifice. And as soon as the sacrifice was over, the people were praying and then they preached and 3,000 people got saved. You find that Peter and John in Acts 3, when they healed the lame guy, were on their way to the temple for the afternoon prayer meeting. And you find that Peter, when, even when he was out of town, stopped at noon to pray, and that's when he got the vision of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Prayer was in the DNA of the early church, and the di disciples said, look, we've been too busy to, to really attend to the, the three times a day prayer, and we're getting back to that. Also, if you are a member of the first church of, uh, in history in Jerusalem, you also fasted twice a day. Think about that. So they said, we're going to give ourselves to prayer. We're going to give ourselves to the word of God. And we're going to invest. We got seven next level leaders we're going to deploy to serve. It says, and the result, verse 7, listen to this. So the preaching about God flourished and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly. And a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. The first church in history went from 120 people in the upper room, listen, to 70 million, I'm sorry, to 1 million in 70 years. And that's because the apostles put in the DNA of the three things every disciple maker must do the three things every pastor must do, pray, teach the word, and invest in disciples. Turn to the person next to you and go, you can do it. <laughs> Let me give you Paul and Timothy. Okay, if this is a true disciple, and I'm teaching pastoral duties, I want to know what Paul told Timothy, the pastoral epistle. Well, I found he gave him three major commands. The first command, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. First of all, among anything else you're going to do, Timothy, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everybody. I want you and your people to pray. First thing, number one priority, prayer. Let me ask you a question. In the ministry of, of your church, is prayer the number one priority? Let me ask you a question. In your life, is prayer the number one priority? I got a little thing back there that says 21 days of prayer, and we're starting the first 21 days of January calling churches to spend that the first 21 days of January saying, we're starting this year with God first and our priorities in line, and we're calling churches to, to have more prayer and have more people praying more often, more effectively, more intensely, with one another more than ever before. Look, for our country, let's just be honest. It's revival or ruin right now. Never been a great revival without great prayer preceding it. What else did he tell Timothy? 2 Timothy 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Chapter 4, verse 2, he says, preach the word. Teach them what it says. Teach them how to apply it. And what did they teach? You've got to realize, these guys couldn't teach uh, Romans or Ephesians because they weren't written yet. They taught everything Jesus commanded because that is the Great Commission, right? You make disciples by teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded. Well, the third thing they did, and Paul tells Timothy, and you know this verse, and the things that you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men, invest in faithful men, and we'll be able to teach others also. Paul said, you multiply the discipleship I put in your life. 
Paul taught Timothy what Paul knew. Dave in the Bathroom Baptist Temple taught Tim and Daryl and Jim and his other brother Daryl uh, <laughs> what Dave knew with, it, with the vision of you take it and you, you teach somebody else also. Turn to the person next to you and go, you can do it. <laughs> you can do this. Well, I mean, I could do this all day. What's the job of a pastor according to Ephesians 4? Equip the saints to do the ministry. How do you equip the saints? Greek lesson, Greek word katarizo. You, you, you define it by seeing where else it is used and in what context it is used. It is used to do three things. It's described in three acts. Prayer, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the word of God who, this is a prayer. He, the writer of Hebrews finishes the book of Hebrews with a prayer. He says, now may the, word, the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete, katarizo, equip you in every good work to do his will. He's praying that God would equip the people. He's praying for his disciples. Pray, teach the word, 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped, cauterizo. The word of God is the only way you can equip people. Prayer is how you equip people. Invest in disciples, Luke 6, 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is cauterizo, has been cauterizo, who's been equipped, perfectly trained, will be like his master. Three things. How do I do my job as a pastor? I focus on three things. Pray, me praying for them, and me getting them to pray. Because Second Timoth uh, 1 Timothy 2, he says, I want everybody praying for everybody in all the community that everybody might be saved. I pray, I want to get them to pray, we want to pray for everybody in our town. I teach the word and teach them how to live it. And I do that as I'm intentionally investing in disciple makers. You can do this if you're 19 and newly saved, and you can do this if you've been a pastor who's a long time. And we, it's what we need to be doing. I give you another one, eternity. There's only a few things that are eternal. Did you realize that? I'm at the point in life where I really only care about what's internal. <laughs> 70, 80 years on this life is going to be that in eternity. What's eternal? Prayer. We're told in Revelation uh, that our prayers are captured as incense. We're told in Psalms that our prayers are captured, written down as incense and, and become worship to God. Prayer is eternal. The Word of God obviously is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. Disciples are eternal. Think about what Paul said to the Thessalonians. He says, what is our joy, our hope, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? You are our glory and joy. You are disciples. You are the ones who, who, who have etern eternity stamped on you. You're our joy when we stand before Jesus. I'm getting older and I get more excited about the churches my disciples have planted and pastored than the, than the churches I have planted and pastored. Let me tell you this, this actually works. I'm not just telling you stuff, this actually works. Started church, I was 26. 31, I got a strange immune system illness. Started church and I was, I, I didn't, I forgot about the three things I did as a 19 year old to make disciples. And I was going seven days a week, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. 
And when I was 30, our church grew. We started with 12 people in my a, a basement of my apartment, and we grew to 300 people in five years, which is pretty good back then. I got sick. I got immune system, went crazy. I was allergic to absolutely everything. I was in constant pain uh, through muscles and joints. My blood sugar bottomed out. I was completely exhausted all the time. I wake up after sleeping eight hours and feel like I just run a marathon. Uh, I, I cognitively, I would, you know, I had COVID cloud before there was COVID cloud. And I could only invest a couple hours a day in my church. I couldn't get out of bed but a couple hours a day. I could only do three things. I spent about an hour praying for my church. I taught the word on Sundays, studied and taught the word on Sundays, and I, I had two, two groups I was leading. One for seekers, so I could do the work of an evangelist, even though I wasn't very healthy. And I had four guys I invested in every week, a couple hours a week, discipling, disciple makers. Pray, word, disciples. That's all I did. I was sick not for a year, not for two years, not for three years. It wasn't until a little over three years I started to get any better. But do you realize my church grew during that time? We went from 300 to 500. And then I realized, you know what, I'm going to just keep three, doing these three things. And the, the guys I discipled all had people they discipled. And eventually, with Dr. Dempsey's help, who was our discipleship pastor, I was, a, I was a lead pastor. We had five pastors, disciple makers. We had 25 directors and coaches over small groups. We had 125 small groups for adults and teenagers. We had a couple thousand people on Sundays. We were baptizing over 100 people a, a year. And really, I only did three things. Started a church in Las Vegas and, and uh, in the worst part of Las Vegas, least reached a part of Las Vegas. And we had 300 people at the end of the first year and we didn't know anybody when we went to Las Vegas. We baptized 127 people our first year. I said, Dave, what did you do? I did three things. Now, I'm, a, I, 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 I'm trying to transition a, a traditional congregational-based church, and, and it's a lot slower ground. But I keep my sanity by doing three things. <laughs> you know, it's exciting when your church plants churches. You guys ever given birth? It's exciting when your group plants a group. It's exciting when your church plants a church. Our first church planted five churches, and people are like, when you send out 70 people to start a church, that's really going to hurt your attendance. Actually, every year we sent out 70 people, we grew, we were growing at about 10 per, 10 or percent a year, 7 to 10 percent a year. We grow 15 to 20 percent the year we sent people out. Three things. Turn the person next to you and go, you can do it. Now, I, I, have, I have several gifts, and uh, one of them is the gift of irritation. <laughs> so, I feel like I'm going to exercise it right now. You're not here by accident. You're not here by accident. I believe God's got a message for you today through one of the breakouts, one of the speakers, one of the songs. Some of you are younger guys. I'm not telling you how to be famous. I'm telling you how to make an impact. 
Some of you are older guys and you know, you know that I'm right, what I'm saying, but it's so easy, I can, I can attest to this, to get drawn into everything else as a pastor. Some of you are not pastors and you're lay people and I've just given you permission and a simple way to make disciples. All you got to do is find somebody on Sunday morning who knows less than you do. <laughs> you can do it. So the question really is very simple. Will you do it? Some of you is going to start by beefing up your prayer life. I found if I'm not praying for my disciples, the enemy will, will keep them from coming through to, to multiply. Really, what is it that you do that's that much more important than talking with God? Will you do it? So I'm a Baptist right now. I'm going to, the church I'm at is Baptist. I'm going to have you bow your head. I'm going to do a Baptist thing right now. So bow your head, would you please? Simple question. If you would say, you know what? First, first, first simple question. You would say, I am doing this, and I, th I thank God for the encouragement today. Would you lift your hand real high? You say, this is what I'm focused on, three things. And I thank God for the encouragement. Oh, I love to see those hands. Just hold them there a second. And you're saying, thank you, God. Use me. You can put them down. Second question. You say, I'm not really doing these things, but I'm saying to God, I am willing. Here am I, use me. Would you raise your hand real high? I'm not doing these things, or I need to do these things more uh, focused, more intentionally. Here am I. Just hold them there, because when you hold your hand up, that's an act of humility, and that's, that's the key to grace. So I'm not really doing these things, and God, here am I. Use me. You may put them down. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your grace and your goodness and your mercy. And thank you so much that you use us. It's a joy. It's a delight. And God, I do pray that you would use us to make an eternal difference in this world through making disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.